learning to paint in watercolours. Today I'm going to tell you why you shouldn't copy some of the things that you see professional artists do. Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here my name is Michelle and on this channel you'll find all things watercolour as well as painting, drawing, tuition, even a little bit of mixed media, business and motivation for artists too. Please do consider subscribing. If you click the bell icon you can get notified every time I have a new video for you. Make at least one free video here a week on a Thursday with extra content for Patreon subscribers. Now, whenever you're trying to learn something in life, learn a new skill, it's very tempting to watch professionals do it and to think that you must copy exactly what they do. Now, of course, it's very good to learn from professional people, so that's not what we're talking about in this video, but it can be a mistake sometimes to try and copy exactly what they do if you're not at that stage yet. And I'm gonna fess up. I got the idea for this video from watching a sewing video. I've been back into my sewing recently dressmaking, that sort of things. And I was watching a lady and she did, um, you know, things that professional sewists, they call them, they don't call them dressmakers anymore, call them sewists, things professional sewists do that you shouldn't copy. And as she went through the video, it made so much sense to me. And I thought this is totally translatable. And I started thinking about all the things that you might see your favorite YouTubers or your favorite artists do on the internet or in a magazine that you probably shouldn't copy if you're at a beginner stage. And sometimes they're things that you shouldn't copy at all. We're all also going to talk about things that can be a little bit misleading on the internet in terms of editing cuts so it's very easy for there to be you know an eight hour gap in a video you know in the filming schedule of the person that's making the video and yet for you it runs on second to second so we're going to talk about that as well and I've got eight things today that if you see professional artists do you want to think twice about copying. So the first thing you may see professional artists do that I encourage you not to do, and that's painting without drawing. Now, at the very beginning of your painting drawing, you're going to need a little bit of structure on your paper. You're going to need some drawing skills. You're going to need to put something down. Now, how much you put onto the paper in terms of drawing is really uh, dependent on the subject that you're doing. If you were doing something you know, really complex, like a building with steps and you know a garden outside trees, all of that, you might need to put quite a lot of information onto your paper. However, if you're doing something really simple, perhaps a, you know, a landscape with a flat horizon and a single river flowing into the distance, perhaps all you need to draw is a single line for the horizon and a river. Not only is it gonna be helpful when you put your paint down, but it's also going to give you an insight into whether or not the composition is going to work. Because if the drawing's not looking great, don't go ahead with the painting. You want to change your drawing first. Now, when you watch people uh, online and they're painting without drawing, don't forget that they probably have been painting and drawing for decades. They probably have some really good drawing skills and painting is just drawing with a brush. So they're able to go straight in. Another thing is they may be being you know, a bit disingenuous. They may have done this subject before they may have done it lots of times before or there may actually be marks on the paper that you can't see or they may be using some kind of projection system so I do advise at least at the beginning of your painting journey that you don't go straight in with the paintbrush just because you see somebody else do it now the next thing you might be inclined to copy is when you see a professional artist you know taking a new color into their painting or perhaps taking a new technique into their painting and they just go ahead straight away and put it on the paper Doubtless they've done it countless times before, or perhaps they're very good at color mixing. Now, when I teach actual real life painting classes, let me grab things from the desk, here we are. I put loads of these on the center of the table. These are just off cuts of watercolor paper. I stretch all my paper onto board, so I always have you know, bits left down the side, and I always have these scraps of paper, and I still use these when I'm painting today, and I do two things with them. Now, I might try a technique with them, and if you're trying something new, you know, if the artist you're copying is doing some salt technique, or, you know, doing something with watercolor pencils, or something, particularly something that you haven't seen before, for goodness sake, don't go straight onto your painting and do that. You've no idea how it's going to look. The artist you're copying probably has a different style of working to you. They're probably more used to the materials. They may even be using different paper and different paint pigments to you. And those things make a big difference to how the technique is going to look. The same with color mixing. Now, if the artist mixes a color and particularly if you are using different colors yourself or even a different brand of paints, 
you may get a different result. And don't forget the watercolors dry up to 50% lighter than when you apply them. So not only should you swatch that color on a scrap of paper first, try out that technique first, you should also let it dry. A lot of techniques, particularly things like salt, can take you know a long while before they reach their sort of their finished effect. And the same with colors, they can dry a lot lighter. So if you haven't used a color before, you haven't done a mix before, you haven't done a technique, I want you just to slow down, work it out on a scrap of paper. If you think it looks okay, let it dry and then place it on your painting, you know, near where it's going to go and decide if you're happy with it. If you're not happy with it, go and practice a little bit more. Try a different color mix before you place it on your paper. I'm amazed when I see so many people mix up a color. You know, when I'm teaching classes, they mix up a color and they will, I don't know, I wasn't sure if this was the right color. So I shoved it on my painting. For goodness sake, just slow yourselves down. Try things out on a scrap of paper before you commit to your paintings. You're gonna have a lot more success and get much better results by doing this. The third thing I don't want you to copy professional artists in doing, and this is painting watercolors on an easel. Now, some artists will do this because it's easier for filming. You get a few artists who do actually work in this way, and if they're doing something like botanical work, not using a lot of water, perhaps they get away with this. They may have come in from other mediums and be completely used to sort of painting and drawing up right now. If you must, if it's important to you, and if you find that you get a better result, you can draw on an easel with your paper upwards, but I guarantee that you'll get a much better result with your paper flat on the table. Watercolor is hard enough. Water levels are really, really important when you're mixing watercolors and putting extra colors on the paper. Uneven water levels are the things that will cause you the most difficulty. And the last thing you need into that mix is gravity. Now, I have seen both sides of this coin because in my previous life before COVID, I was going out to lots of art clubs and doing evening demonstrations and they would put a camera or projector on me. Sometimes I would work flat and they would have a projector above my head, which um, causes its own issues. But more often than not, they would ask me to work on an easel and I would have subjects that I would choose that were fairly loose, things like seascapes that I could just about cope with painting on an easel. But I can tell you, even with the level of controls that I've got over watercolors, it's never easy to paint on an easel, especially not if you're doing something like a big sky, a big landscapes, the paint is going to run down. Now there is a school of thought that says you should have a slight angle to your board. It helps a wash to travel down the paper. This is true, but you've still got that bead of paint at the bottom there that you have to deal with. So you can experiment yourself whether you like your board at a very slight angle or whether you like your board flat. Yes, it can cause neck issues. I work on a uh, very high table, so I'm not bending forwards too much. And I take regular breaks. But if you see somebody painting watercolors on an easel, trust me, you don't want to copy that, especially not when you're a beginner. It's gonna make everything so much more difficult. At this point, if you're finding this video helpful and getting some value from it, can I please ask you to do me a favor and uh, click that thumbs up, click that like button for me. It really helps me with the YouTube algorithm. If you can like, share, subscribe, it's free, or even leave me a comment, YouTube will push this video out to more people and I can help teach more people how to paint and draw. So the next thing you shouldn't try to copy is loose painting. And oh my goodness, this drives me crazy. This one, I see so many people sort of in complete beginners say, well, I want a loose painting tutorial. You know, where do I, how do I learn to paint loosely? You don't learn to paint loosely. It's the end of the journey, not the beginning. It's like learning, people say, okay, how can I learn to paint abstract? You don't learn to paint abstract. Abstraction is a process that you may or may not reach after many years and decades of learning to paint. And you can't throw yourself straight into loose painting. It just doesn't work that way. You should just concentrate on working from what you see when you start out. As you go through your painting journey, you will develop your own style, which may be loose or may be tight. You may even go into botanical accuracy. You cannot judge this from the beginning. You can't judge what kind of artist you are going to be. It's like, you know, if you can't drive a car, saying to yourself, oh, well, I think I like driving very large cars. I don't want a small car. I'm going to enjoy driving a large car. You have absolutely no idea if that is true. And when you start your artistic journey, you have no idea what kind of artist you are going to be because it's all about your personality and you do not get to choose. You don't get to choose what sort of artists you are going to be. And if you try to choose, if you try to force a style, if you try to copy other people, then all that's going to happen is you're going to end up being a poor imitation of that other artist or of that other style. 
the way that you find your best artistic style is just to follow your heart. Sounds really hippie, doesn't it? But you really just need to explore your own way of working and your style will find you. You can't just skip all those individual stages of learning to draw, of learning to paint accurately, of learning to understand things. If you look at any of these, you know, if you look at cubists, if you look at abstract painters, they didn't start there. They started on representational work and they progressed to that point naturally. You need to progress to the sort of artist that you're going to be naturally. You can't just jump in and paint loosely because you think either it's an attractive style or it appeals to you because you think, well, that seems to be easier than painting more accurately. It just doesn't work that way. I don't advise you ever to seek out loose painting tutorials unless you naturally have started to paint that way. Of course, you can learn something from every artist. You can learn something from every tutorial, but do not at the beginning of your painting journey, try to skip all of these steps. Don't try to force a style on yourself. And don't seek out loose painting just because you think it looks really nice. So the next thing I don't encourage you to copy, and this one is heavily related to the previous one because it's almost a way of making your work look like it's a loose painted work, and that is splattering. Now, I use splattering myself as a technique. For instance, if I'm painting a beach and I want the idea of lots of tiny little pebbles, then I might do some splattering, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this fad of splattering big splodges of paint all over your painting. Now, especially if you're a beginner, I want you to think about this logically. So imagine for a second that you had never picked up a paintbrush, that you weren't an artist at all, but a friend of yours had started to learn to paint and you went round to your friend's house, you looked at one of the paintings and you said, oh, it's not bad actually. And you said to your friend, is it finished? Have you finished this painting? And your friend said, oh, well, it's almost finished, but what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna get some paint and a paintbrush. I'm going to flick splatters of paint on top of this painting. Ask yourself if that would seem to you to be a very sensible thing to do. Might you not say to your friend, is that really a good idea? Are you sure that's what you want to do? And your friend will probably say, oh, well, I, I saw some professional artists do it. So just calm down a bit with the splattering, especially if you're a beginner. Now, splattering, and I've seen these techniques, you know, done quite well, but the problem is it's become a fad. It's become something that everybody copies, usually quite badly. And if you are a complete beginner, the likelihood of you getting a good result from this, if you don't really know why you're doing it, you're just copying someone you've seen online, is not high. So if you've done quite a reasonable painting and you're thinking now about getting a paintbrush and dripping loads of paint on top or splattering loads of paint on top. Maybe just stop for a minute, have a cup of tea and think about whether you actually want to do this. So the next technique that you might not want to copy or the next thing you might not want to copy is dipping a dirty paintbrush into, into clean paints on your palette. I've spoken more about this in a recent video, which is how to make brighter colors. There are times when it's not too much of a bad thing to do to dip a paintbrush that's got one color on it into a clean pan or puddle of paint and to use it, you know, it all depends on what colors you're using, but it can be a little bit misleading, especially if you're watching YouTube videos. Now, when I edit my YouTube videos, I've got a chap called Jimmy now helping me to edit my videos, but for many years I edited my own videos and I still do a lot of my own editing too. Often what we cut out is stuff that's just taking up space where nothing's happening. So on YouTube, you know, people that watch YouTube have uh, the attention span of gnats a lot of the time and they click off a video if nothing is happening. So that little gap where I used one paint color and then I rinsed my paintbrush and also the, uh, the water jar can make real loud sort of tinny noises. That gap where I rinse my paintbrush, make that noise and then I bring it back to the drawing board. We often just cut that out in the edit and you barely notice it happening. You can cut out you know, as much as two or three seconds and the human eye almost doesn't pick it up. So when you think that an artist you're watching hasn't cleaned their paintbrush, chances are they actually have cleaned it and they've just cut it out in the edit. There are also times when going between certain colors when it's really disastrous not to clean your brush. So as I said, have a look at that other video and that'll help you because you know we are human beings, we can't clean our paintbrush every time we place it on our palette, but there are times when it's a good idea and times when it's a bad idea. So just be a little bit careful when you're copying artists doing this and be aware that you may just be missing a few seconds footage in the edit. So the next thing that you shouldn't copy is when artists just go directly from one area of wet paint and a start painting next to it. Now, again, this is one that is very, very commonly cut out in a video edit. And of course, the artist that's doing the demonstration will want to help you and they'll say, well, make sure you let this bit dry and now we'll do the next bit. 
And you know, it's barely a second. It may have taken them two or three hours to let this dry. And it's actually something that professional artists do all the time is to let their work dry. Now I have filmed videos for Patreon and things like this where I've been working on my own paintings. And you know, it's literally a whole weekend. And yet when they see the video clip, it almost runs straight on. And as much as the artist will say, make sure this bit is completely dry, in your head, you might be thinking, oh, you're five or 10 minutes, that's okay. But actually it can take much, much longer. So just be very, very aware. You know, it's this water levels thing. Again, if you're painting wet paint next to a damp area, it's going to bleed right into that area. So be very careful when copying professional artists, if they don't appear to wait very long between areas, most professional watercolorists know that there are times when you have to wait several hours for a piece of paper to get bone dry before you paint next to it. So it's just something else to be aware of. So the next thing that you shouldn't copy is going from the start to the finish of your painting without stopping. This again can be something that's very deceptive on videos. It can also be something that you pick up if you go to, you know, a two hour painting class, there can be this real feeling of, you know, I have to get a finished piece of work by the end of it. I've had a lot of students say to me, well, I, I just never paint at home by myself because I'm just too busy. So when I come here, you know, I want to get my painting finished. Otherwise I know that if, you know, if I've got half an hour left to do it, I go home. I know that, you know, practically speaking, I'm not going to do that. So you can get into this real habit of, you know, a painting, you know, and I often see beginners say, you know, well, I did this painting, you know, start to finish, took me an hour and a half. And what you need to understand is the professional artists never ever work that way in reality. They may appear to work that way on demonstration videos, but the truth is we take much, much longer. I will take somewhere between 20 and 40 hours on a painting, and that's if I were painting in one go, and I don't and I will have frequent breaks. If you ever find yourself in a painting and you're thinking, well, I don't know if it's finished or I don't know if it needs any more. I'm not sure if that color there is bright enough. I'm not sure it's working well enough. I don't know quite where to go next with it. That is the point where a professional artist will just stop painting and leave their painting either overnight and go out and do something else. You know, I wish I had full days just to sit and paint. I don't. So it's very easy for me to make these breaks. But if you are perhaps retired and you have a free afternoon, it's very tempting just to push on and push on and push on until you finish that painting. And often you get to the end of it, you're not entirely happy with it. It's a really, really good idea to take breaks. It will help you to see where things are wrong as well, because you can just get far too close to a painting. You lose the ability to see the tonal contrast. You lose the ability to see the whole painting. It's like if you were making a patchwork quilt and you spend all your time joining these little pieces. At some point, you've got to step back and look at that quilt and see, is it working overall? Does it look good from a distance? And it's not just a matter of viewing it from a distance. Having that break from it will help you to see it afresh. If you are perhaps drawing a house and the perspective is wrong and you feel like something's wrong but you can't see where it is, I've done this myself. If you go out for a couple of hours and do something else, you go for a walk, come back and look at that painting or that drawing again. Chances are you'll immediately see what's wrong. And the same with a painting where you're just not sure if it's finished, you'll come back and you'll immediately see if you're happy with it or if something else needs adding. You'll be able to see the tonal contrast better. Professional artists take breaks from their work all the time. I myself never sit and do a painting from start to finish without a break. So again, this is something that you may be watching on a video tutorial or you may have got into the habit of being in a class and having to finish on a deadline. But if you've got more time and if you're just working at home, I want you to take regular breaks from your painting. Don't try to copy what you see the professionals do or think you see the professionals do in painting from start to finish without stopping. So you'll notice at this point my hairstyle has changed. That's because I had to take a short break in filming. Do let me know in the comments if you enjoyed this video and what you agree with and disagree with when it comes to the things I've spoken about. It's fine to disagree, but don't be a troll. It's not Harry Potter. Now, before you leave this video, don't forget to pop into the video description. I've got lots of free stuff for you there. I've got free downloadable PDFs, even a free watercolor mini course that you can take for no money whatsoever. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you'll enjoy the video that I made about using deliberate practice in order to improve your speed of learning really, really fast. You can watch that video right now.